Our Father's Arms, nestled in the beautiful foothills of Appalachia in the southeastern United States and northeast Alabama, Our Father's Arms is a place of healing and deliverance. Each day, we turn our hearts toward God's Word. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, one for each day of the month. The proverb for the day provides a springboard and commentary to the rest of Scripture. We invite you to join us as we relax, open our Bibles, and trust Him to speak to our hearts. so high. Just look at the sparkle in the little child's eyes. Just look at the man on the cross. That's what eternal life costs just to think about his love for you. That'll show love give you an attitude of gratitude. see are beginning to see the truth overflow with gratitude. People that complain and whine and blame shift are people who are spiritually blind. Not shame on you. Love never says shame on you. You can't walk like you don't have. So am I willing to, I don't like living in darkness. Amen. You know, I don't, you know, I, I, I kind of knew I was cursing my own life when I was cursing other people and accusing and fault finding and, and blame shifting. And, and you know, I, one thing I knew for sure is that that ain't a blessed life. Okay, so I thought I had to change my external circumstances to find happiness. I mean, you know, if I'm miserable where, where I'm at, if I'm miserable where I am, or where I'm at in Redneck, if I'm miserable where I'm at, then I can change and run away from my misery. But an amazing thing happens. When the grass is green on the other side, I get that grass over there and I start finding fault with everything around me there. Ain't no such thing as gravity. The earth just sucks. What's this world coming to? I, I, I saw uh, this quote by this guy, Edmund Burke, I think his name was. It's a famous quote. It says, the best way for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Have you heard that? I've heard that. I was in a meeting of Muslims. And this lady jumped up and said that. And she was angry. And I thought, this was, I was invited to go up there and share a long story and won't go into it. 
But I, I was, my, my wife and I were, after going to Istanbul, Turkey, invited over there, and I fell in love with these Muslim people. And I wrote a book called WWMD, What Would Muhammad Do? And it's Islam, a Mirror of the Bible Belt. And basically, the book is about religions that say you've got to do right to be right with God. That's legalism. If you could do right to be right with God, Jesus wouldn't have died for you. But there's even a religion called Christianity that's still telling you you've got to do something to be right with God. It's a counterfeit. And we'll talk about counterfeits here in a minute. Okay, and it was like when I was there uh, preparing to go, this, uh, this man who's a dear friend, I still love the Muslim people, you know. Muslim, Christian, Hindu, atheist, Jew, Jesus died for all, not just a few. Red and yellow, black and white, we're all precious in his sight. And just because you're not like me doesn't mean that you're wrong. Just because we dance a different dance and sing a different song, there's plenty of room in this big old crazy world for each of us to belong. And just because you don't see from the same perspective I do, who am I to judge you? I'm not smart enough to judge you. I'm not smart enough to judge even me. So it's amazing the freedom that comes when you get rid of that gavel. Well, what I was saying is, is this precious lady got up and said that. I said, I've heard that before. And then some of the people that, now we, we did pretty good. Uh, you know, on the way over there, now this is, a, they rented a civic center. And my topic was how Christians perceive Muhammad. And there was a, an imam there, a, a Muslim preacher, who was the chairman of the Supreme Council of Islam for all of Canada. And his topic was how, how Muslims perceive Jesus Christ. It was not a debate. I didn't go debate the Bible and Quran, though that Muslim pastor did that. Okay, and, and, and this friend who got patting me off the plane up there, they read the book, see, and the book was not hostile toward, he didn't read the book, he read the back cover of the book, where it says, who is this mystic named Muhammad? You know, and if we'll have a, if, if we will not feel threatened by somebody that has a different worldview than we have, then we can find the faith that's real. That was on the back cover of the book. And they were preparing a lawsuit for uh, all the Christian writers that were propagating hatred toward Muslims. And so they go to Amazon.com to get mine, and I get this email that says, uh, we would like to thank Bob McLeod for not being unkind to our people. And he's welcome to come up here and share his faith anytime. And the next thing I know, Patty and I landed in Toronto, where there's this, this group of Muslims from Pakistan, and they rented a civic center up there. Okay, that's at the stage for all this. I, didn't, I had no idea we'd get off on this. But it's worth sharing with you. When I was, got this invitation, for just a fraction of a second, I was afraid that peer pressure and those things would cause me to compromise And uh, for a fraction of a second, and then the Holy Spirit reminded me of something. In, pre in preparing me for that time, he reminded me that a man with an experience is not, is not threatened by a man with an argument. And I was just going to share with them what Jesus had done for me. <laughs> and I was also, and this was amazing, how God poured his love out in my heart toward those people. So we show up, and, uh, and we go into the Civic Center, and I'm, I'm over here with this guy that uh, doesn't like me just because I'm a Christian or whatever. And he, uh, he, he was, don't you know I hadn't read your book? I said, man, that's cool, neither is my wife. <laughs> I said, you know, do you, tell me about your family. And I started asking him questions about jihad and other, other things I won't go into. And, uh, but he started letting his guard down a little bit, and, and he realized I wasn't there to challenge him. And so I, I, this, was, this was the day before, so June 13th, I forgot what year, but it was the day before of our 36th or 7th wedding anniversary. You know, and so the, what they were trying to do is make peace because there was such, this, after 9-11, there was this incredible backlash of hatred coming from the West, Christians, toward Muslims, radical Muslims, blaming, you know, just that tension and everything. And, and they were trying to, and preparing that lawsuit to, people, to writers that were propagating hatred towards Satan, Mohammed, and all that stuff. And these, these people grew up like that, like we grew up in the Bible Belt. 
you know, so you're attacking a culture, you know, when you do that. And, and it was like, and the first thing that our, our host said when he got us off the airplane, he said, I want you to know my wife, Ishrat, and I are, are go-go Muslims. I said, what is that? And he said, we don't, we don't buy into all that radical religious stuff. We go to go-go clubs and have a good time. I thought, okay. okay. <laughs> and so, so I was there, and the plan was is to, is to get this, uh, this young lady who was a Muslim to give me this big bouquet of flowers. And they're going to get a little Christian girl to give Sayed the, a, the bouquet of flowers. So he's trying the best to, to just... You know, let's don't let's stop killing each other. You know, and so uh, so I, it was a surreal moment. So I, I was there in this civic center, and Patty and I were were two different. We looked different. We we were dressed different. We were just surrounded, you know, by Muslims, most of whom were from from uh, Pakistan. And so I uh, she gave me these flowers. And I said, and my mother bought me a suit to go up there. And I, I just told him, I said, look, this is surreal. I just tell him to tell the group, this is, this is surreal. I said, Tarek, who invited us up here, asked me to dress like a reverend from the South. That's why I got on this. My mama bought me this suit to wear up here. And I'll just be quite honest with you. Um, I'm blue jeans, T-shirt, and a guitar. And, uh, but I, you know, I wanted to, to do what our, our host uh, asked me to do. So that's why I got a suit on. And I said, and you give me these flowers, it's beautiful, and I just want to thank you for your kindness and your hospitality. And, and when I was invited to go to Istanbul, Turkey, and the way that the community there received me and loved me, and, and I said, you know, it was, uh, I didn't know anything about Islam or, or whatever. This is before 9-11 when I went over there, in fact, the year before. And I said, so it was, uh, it was confusing to me, and I was willing to become a Muslim if that's where the light was leading me. So, if, you know, take another look. Is Mohammed the last prophet? You know, and it's, look, I grew up in the Bible Belt like this kid, Hassan, grew up in Istanbul in, in Islam. All of his ancestors, the Quran is their holy book. Just like the Holy Bible is our holy book. So how much of this is culture and how much of this, you know, and it's like, I'm willing to come to the light. All right, Jesus, I cried out to you. I got a little glimpse of a cross and that you love me with a love that's greater than my selfishness and my sin and I am personally being liberated and starting to enjoy life and love other people because you first loved me. I'm experiencing that. Now, are you leading me here to show, take me another step? Is what the Muslims say about you true that you are a highly revered prophet of God? And you're going to come back with the final prophet, Mohammed, that came here to straighten out all of the heresy that the Apostle Paul put in the scriptures right here and, and the people of the book we call uh, Israel. And, and, you know, and they, it's not anti-Jesus or the patriarchs. So I'm willing. So I start studying it for myself. And I get in and I start looking at the five pillars of Islam. And I start seeing in the Bible Belt, Christians practice the very same thing. It's just culturally different. In the book, WWMD, What Would Mohammed Do? The subtitle is Islam, A Mirror of the Bible Belt. If there's anyone watching this on the Internet, uh, it's available out there. Uh, just do What Would Mohammed Do? Bob McLeod. Or Amazon's got it, whatever. And, um, and basically, it was just the personal experience that I had and having a greater insight as to what legalism is. Do right to be right. Okay, so I'm back to this uh, conference thing, and it was my turn. I go first, right? And so I'm standing there in a suit, and I feel like, I don't tell you what I feel like, but, but I, I, I miss my blue jeans and my T-shirts. And, and Patty was sitting over here, and I took these flowers. And I said, you're so kind, and we love you very much. And I said, but I want you to know, I've got to tell you the truth. I had a problem with God. If there is a God, I don't like him because innocent people, precious children, people of all ages, life's a setup. And when my best friend was killed, I got hostile. This ain't fair. Life is unjust. 
you start getting close to somebody and, and they're gone, well, I'm not going to let anybody get close to me again, even if it's little kids calling me daddy or a wife that calls me her husband. I'm not going to go through that again. And if it is a God Almighty, I don't like him. So there. What do you do? You get your guard up. I said, I shared with a funeral friend yesterday. Listen, I used to sit around and wonder what in the world am I doing here? There's got to be more to life than living in a constant fear. I even tried to hide so lonely inside, scared to death of dying down here, dying all alone down here. And every time I'd pass a graveyard, I'd turn and look the other way. I couldn't bear to face the reality that me and my loved ones would die one day. I was like an old scared and scroungy dog gone stray. Till Jesus took me in, began to love my fear away. So there I was, and I was sharing this with them. And I said, so what do you do? You know, you put up a defense wall, and you get cynical toward life as a setup. And your defense wall becomes a prison wall and you're lonely as hell in there. But you're scared to come out because you'll get hurt again and again and again and again. So I'm in this lonely as hell inside. And so what do you do? Now what I'm going to share with you tonight is every human being, including you, what fuels your life is love. Just like love is an active verb, it's not static. <laughs> you know, and, and we're having a total redefinition of what that love is. That love with a hook in it, it's not love at all. If there's a hidden agenda that you got to do something. You know, love just loves, and it's, it's love fuels us. We were created to be recipients and expressions of love. Lay your life down, no hook in it, agape, love, with no conditions. All right, so now what we're doing is we are, we are created that way. And so what we do is we try to find fuel we try to find love, but we are totally surrounded by counterfeits. And it's like trying, trying to pour kerosene in your gas tank and getting your car to run. You spitter and you sputter and you break down. Have you been spittering and sputtering and breaking down in your life journey? All right, so what, what did I want to do? What, what was I driven to do? I'm looking for love, but I ain't got any idea there's a God that loves you because I've been drawing conclusions on life based on the cruelty of life and the horror in this planet of men, man's inhumanity to man and all the betrayals and all, you know, and all this. But, but what are you doing? You're doing it because you're running on love. You're looking for love. Every human being is looking for love, but you're surrounded by counterfeits. You're pouring kerosene in your tank. And one of the counterfeits is smoke this. This will make you feel better. And it does. Drink this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, until it breaks out in a bloody war and you're killing somebody over a girl or something. or You know, and then she stole from you and she, you know, and then, you know, and it's almost like in what started out just having so much fun turned into a, a drunken brawl. You know, wake up the next morning, your whole side of your head's falling up because you didn't, you wasn't able to duck quick enough and all that. It, you know, I thought he was my friend. He was until he got that fire water in him and some Indian in him. You know, that, that, that fire water? <laughs> you know, I, and I, I'll tell you, I'm feeling kind of low. I can't wait to get off work, go home, drink me a six pack. It turns into half a case or whatever. And so what? And I'm feeling better until I'm commode hugging drunk, throwing my guts out, you know, and headache the next morning, all that stuff. And, that ain't love. That's the counterfeit. Okay, so listen, we're going to see this in a minute. When you see in the Bible adultery, that is a reference to idolatry. We are looking for love in all the wrong places. 
and everything around you has been telling you all your life, if you have this, you'll be happy. If you have that, you'll be happy. And someone is saying, uh, the way for evil to prevail is good people to do nothing. And they were, when I realized that they were, t- they, they considered their enemy and evil to be where I came from. And as soon as one of those ladies, this, this was later on, Patty said, I started getting nervous when she said, you look like George Bush. <laughs> Hey, he looks like George Bush. (laughs) They hated. Would you tell your president to quit bombing our children? And what they perceived to be evil was the West. And the crusaders with Bibles who were Christians killing and slaughtering and raping and murdering people. Bible thump inspect inspectors, condemn men complain. God spoke to me through Bon Jovi. They give love a bad name. <laughs> and so now, I so said, wait a minute. All right, so now I'm back up in front of these people. And I just said, look, I became a drug addict. I couldn't face life, man. I had to have my fix. I had to get some relief. And I was dying. <laughs> and I had a drug problem. And that lady married to me had a husband problem. And those three little kids right there had a daddy problem because they never knew when I was coming home. And the music thing and the studios and, the, and you know, and there just seemed to be enough money flowing all the time for me to kill myself and throw some at them to try to justify my rebellion and all. But that morning, that 10 years of living in a cannabis cloud and, and, uh, and, and, and alcohol was, a, was the pouring alcohol on my depression, like trying to put out a fire with gasoline, you know. And, and I was tormented, tormented man. And if there is a God, I don't like him. So somebody witnessed to me, I was ready for him. If I get saved, will it make me like you? You self-righteous SOB. If you die tonight, Bob, I'll come on. I was ready. And I'd, I'd read that Bible to get ammunition to argue with religious people. I don't, I don't want nothing to do with your religion. I'm not a Christian, and I do not believe in your Jesus. By the way, I still don't. Counterfeit. There's a bunch of counterfeit Jesuses. Amen. Every street corner's got a church. Every church sings a different song. Some say Jesus just arrived. Others say he's coming soon. Some will drag you in. Some will kick you out. Bits seem self-righteous and absurd. They all disagree yet claim authority in the same book, <laughs> saying it's God's word. The devil appears as an angel of light. Evil dresses up like good. Claim they're serving you, Jesus. And Lord, I know you wish they would. It seems your plan of redemption, Lord, has been misunderstood. I'm beginning to see what you mean in 2 Corinthians 11, 13. That's where he says, the devil appears as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. <coughs> seems your plan of redemption, Lord, has been misunderstood. I'm beginning to see what you mean in 2 Corinthians 11, 13. And... So now I'm standing with those people, and I said at 3 o'clock one morning, she never knew when I was coming home, and I stumbled in the back door, and she's sitting over in the corner of the den crying at 3 o'clock in the morning. I knew she'd been there all night. Got the babies to bed. She didn't even acknowledge me coming in the house. So I walk in. Would you please cuss me so I can blame you for my misery? Suffering love held up a mirror and I saw how much I hated myself and I knew that life was over. I tried to quit drinking and I did great for a day or two. He took 11 steps and then he fell. Let go of the hope of heaven, grabbed a hold of hell. (coughs) But I knew that life was over and and I figured I couldn't quit. They say you can't get addicted to pot. Well, I I sure had to have it, whatever you call that. Pills, anything else I could get. So she wasn't going to talk to me. So I went upstairs to get that pistol. Expensive, Ruger 38, pearl handle, revolver. 
I'd sit there with a bottle of wild turkey in one hand and that pistol in another right there next to my temple, loaded. And the depression was like a steamroller rolling over my head. I mean, it. and I wanted to die, and I'd romance it. It'd be so easy. I went upstairs to get that pistol. I hated me so bad. I hated life so bad. And before I got to the side table of where the pistol was, I fell on my knees. And here's what came out of this man, this young man, at 3 o'clock in the morning alone. I've made fun of you. I've made fun of people that say they know you. You may be a myth. Superstition. Old people know they're going to die. I don't know nothing, but I'm in hell on earth. And Jesus Christ, if you're real, help. I passed out on the floor. Next morning, I, I, I wake up and there's, I smell bacon cooking. She's down there cooking breakfast. And I go down the steps and our oldest son, Scotty's about four. Daddy, daddy, daddy. He comes up to me, grabs pants. Come look, there's an alligator in the tree. It's what he didn't say. Why do you make our mother cry? Why are you never here? Why are you such a sorry human being? You call yourself a daddy? No, daddy, daddy, come look. And I went out there to see that alligator in the tree and it's a lizard. <laughs> I thought, where'd you come from? I think I like you. And I'm letting the guard down, see. And I look up and I see the first blue sky I had ever seen. Where did that come from? And I mean, it was almost like a butterfly flying in formation. Right here, it just stopped. Wow. I was getting outside of myself. Not one religious thought, I ought to be in church, I need to quit, you know, none of, none of that stuff. In fact, I didn't quit nothing right away. Except hard liquor. That, that, that ended it for, anyway, that's, that's a whole other story. But I went to get a Bible a week later. But it was not to get ammunition to argue with religious people. I was just curious. And when I opened it up to John's gospel, I read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came into his own, his own knew him not. He was despised and rejected of men. What? But to as many as received him, to them he gave power to become children of God. And I thought, suffering and death is not the creator, the almighty one's fault. It's the result of our, my rebellion against him. We brought the curse. We've dug our own grave. We've dug them deep. We dug our own grave as heaven weeps. We must be so depraved. We just keep on digging our own grave. It's my rebellion that brought this curse. But he demonstrated a love for me and that while I was yet a sinful, self-centered sinner, Jesus took all of the consequences of the law of karma of the seeds that I had sown on himself. What are you going to do with a love like that? <clears throat> Suffering love met me one morning at 3 o'clock in our den, but suffering love met me that morning again on a cross. And that cross of an innocent man being totally ridiculed and humiliated. And let me just tell you who that man is. He's the one who with one thought could have called 12 legions of angels and planted earth and all the people that lived, would live, have ever lived, would be, get their just dessert and the seeds we sown, we would take the wrath of God that's on all disobedience, and we would be in hell throughout all eternity, a black hole, and he'd start and build him another earth with people that would love him. One thought he could have done that. He has all power and authority in heaven and earth. Read about it in Colossians 1. Jesus Christ is the one by whom and for whom everything was created in heaven and earth, the visible and the invisible. And he says from that blood-soaked cross, I'm not going to quit loving you. I understand you're a scared and scroungy dog gone stray, but I'm here to take you in and love your fear away. And that mirror was on a cross 2,000 years ago exposing each of our selfishness and sin and the consequence of it. So I'm telling these civic center 
full of Muslims in there, that story. And I said, because, I said, look, if I was born in Istanbul or Pakistan, I might have cried out to Mohammed, but I wasn't and I didn't. I cried out to Jesus. And because Jesus Christ lives in this lady sitting on the front row right here, I know you don't mind if I give these flowers to her. Tomorrow's our anniversary. <laughs> and these little old ladies with their heads covered with tears rolling down their face. And I go over there to Patty and she stands up. I hand them to her and I kiss her on the cheek. I'll never forget the look on her face. Yeah, right. <laughs> You never get me flowers. <laughs> and, and these people stand up. And the Holy Spirit if I be lifted up I will draw all men unto me. Not if I'm listen nobody's ever come to know him by being on the Losing the end of an argument. We can't look down our nose at someone else when we're washing their feet. And that's the heart of love that opens blinded eyes to see. Jesus still eats with sinners. Today he had lunch with me. He took all the condemnation away when he died on Calvary. And he keeps reminding you and me, he never said to curse the darkness. We're to let his light shine. He never said put down your neighbor or leave this... Or, or treat this troubled world unkind. So leave the judging to the judge. When love is tested, that's when you see it's really love. Our Jesus never ridicules the blind. We can rejoice even in the darkness because it's there we can see his light shine. And the light shine on us that day, and they're still dear friends. And, and, um, and so you had the pastor. I love him so much, you know. Uh, and he, when I sat down, this man that had trouble even being in the same room with me, he put his arm around me. He said, Reverend, that was wonderful. <laughs> and he stood up and took, took his time to tell those people, you cannot be a Muslim if you don't love Jesus. They have a tremendous reverence and respect for the Lord Jesus Christ as a prophet of Allah. But what they say and what they've been taught is Allah would never allow his prophet to suffer like that. Okay. Do right to be right. Is heresy. If you could do right to be right, whatever it is, from five pillars to eating nothing but vegetables, going to church on Saturday, or the, whatever the Sabbath, or keep it, you know what? If you've got to do right to be right, like you joined our church, you started tithing, and then you backslid for a year, well, you owe us back tithes. Well, can I make payments on it? <laughs> yeah, just give it here. If you've got to do right to be right, it's heresy. If you had to do right to be right, Jesus would not have had to die for you. You're not loved because of what you do and what you don't do. You're loved because of who you are. He created you for himself, and he's not going to stop loving you. Those of you who have children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not a matter of will you behave yourself so I'll love you. I love you. I didn't love you any less when you're drunk with a pistol to your head, Bob. While you were hating you, I wasn't hating you. I was bringing you to a place at 3 o'clock in the morning where you would just cry out with one little thread of faith that Jesus Christ, if you're real. By the way, that prayer was 1978. He's real. Amen. I'm not alone in that prison in my heart anymore. 
and this love I have for you, this fuel of life, is because I'm first letting him love me. Come on now. I'm learning to not be upset with somebody else who's upset. I'm learning to not let this troubled world get the best of me. I'm learning to not get offended by somebody else's offense. I'm learning to not straddle the fence. I'm learning to live free. And so are you if you're teachable. We're learning to live the freedom of unfailing love. We're learning to feel the power that flows from above. I know there's trouble in store. I know there's much, much more I need to learn about living the freedom of unfailing love. The Sermon on the Mount is the key. The Master says, love even your enemy. My worst enemy was in the mirror. Can I get a witness on that one? My worst enemy was in the mirror. It's getting clearer and clearer and clearer to see if I'm to love my neighbor, I must first let the master love me. Yeah, but. That's buddy, yeah, but. He's a lying, parasite, power of darkness demon. And he talks to you. Yeah, but there's another lion, parasite, Paris, darkness, demon called Ivan. Ivan, if only. Well, if only you hadn't done that. If only you'd done that. If only, that's Ivan, if only. He's a demon. Don't let him live in your house, which is your heart. Nor buddy, yeah, but. God loves you, yeah, but. He expects you to. Two demons have been exposed. I'm going to expose a third one. Her name is Juanita. You know what her last name is? What if? <laughs> so don't let Buddy, Ivan, and Juanita live in your house. God says, I love you. Now, this is, we got an identity thing going on here. And oftentimes, we got to wear a bunch of masks. We see that, no, that, that ain't me. That ain't me. That ain't me. Well, who the... Helena Montana. <laughs> yeah. Listen, he's, clean, he's cleaning my language up. It's, it's been cleaned up a lot, but, but every once in a while that this word comes out. And it's not stupid, but you know, that's. But I've. Listen, th- 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 this is getting sort of like training wheels on a bicycle until I start, you know, talking pure and everything. I'm a lot purer than I was, all right? But, but it's like um, every time I just, it surprises me. I, I can't tell you how many years I spend apologizing for saying the shit. <laughs> I mean, I, I would. I just, dang, it came out again, you know. And it's like, God, I'm so sorry. I don't want any unwholesome word to proceed from my mouth except that just, which is for the edifying and the building up of the body, you know. So I'm so sorry. I had a friend of mine that was coaching a little football team together, and, was, and, and something happened, and I went, Shh. And, 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 and he was laughing at me, and he said, look, man, I'm sorry. I said, he said, I'm not laughing because you said that. I'm laughing because you've been apologizing for it for the last hour. <laughs> you know? He said, Bob, let it go. You know? All right, so listen, just, this is a little footnote in passing. If that S word comes out of your mouth, it's okay. Here's what you do. You say, shit. Just go, zoo puppy. <laughs> shit, zoo puppy. So, yeah, you can take that in home, will you? All right. How did I get off on that? Okay, we are learning. You are learning and discovering who you are. And who you are is not necessarily who those around you expect you to be. What we have here is an identity crisis. Billy's dad was a vicious drunk, evil, spiteful, and mean. 
Billy would cling to his mother those dreadful bloody nights you could hear them scream. Billy's dad wore a Copenhagen cap, tank top, tattoos, and jeans. Billy never wore a cap. He preferred lace and feminine things. <laughs> Lipstick and mascara from the time he was 10. He so despised his dad, he'd rather die than be like him. The neighbors wondered why in the world would Billy grow up believing he's a girl. If you think you are a rooster, you'll cock a doodle doo at the dawn. If you think you are a hound dog, you'll be howling all night long. If you think you are a loser or an addict or a sinner, you'll be losing, drugging, and sinning all day long. This mask ain't me. Mistaken identity. Are you listening? I am about to speak a word of truth to you that will totally, absolutely transform your life from the inside out. Happiness is your birthright. Amen. What does that mean? Here's what it means. You were born to be blessed. You are a child of the King. You were born for success. You are an heir of everything. Then along came the lie. The whole world began to cry. Self-doubt and shame hiding the light from above. The lie that says you're not loved. you got to prove yourself if you're ever going to be. This mask ain't me. Mistaken identity. Happiness is your birthright. I'm no longer bound by what I think they think of me. I'm no longer a slave to the things I think I see. Love broke through a blood-soaked cross, and I'm beginning to see I am loved. Say that. I am loved. Say it. I am loved. Filled with hope from above. Filled with hope from above. I am loved. I am loved. I am loved. I don't do right to be right. I do right because I am right. I am right because he made me right. And he makes me right because I surrender in the arms of my father and receive his love. I get nothing from God except that which I receive. So I receive. Only a child can see that and a theologian miss it. I might as well just put this thing down. I ain't going to sing those two songs anyway. I'm going to show you something in Proverbs 5. That was the introduction to Proverbs 5. <laughs> fifth day of the month. You know, March 5th is my daddy's birthday. He, he was born on March 5th, uh, 1922. I, I guess that would make him 96, but he self-destructed when he was uh, 55. And, um, and I, don't, I didn't know. I, I was just a little boy in, in the household, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and basically what was going on is we never settled. I, I grew up in, in California and in South Georgia and South Alabama, and, all, and my daddy was constantly on the move. And I had no idea till later that when my daddy, the baby in the family, was four years old, he had his cherished, loving, cuddling, holding, nurturing mother <coughs> suddenly die. Died of typhoid fever. She got a bad fish at a church eat out and, her, and my granddad, my dad's dad was the pastor of this church and with, with, with three small children and all of a sudden she's dead. And my daddy, that little boy living in my daddy, he, he, you know, he, he became incredibly successful after I left home and everything because just what a brilliant guy and I, I sure love my daddy but my daddy self-destructed too because and he never could stay in one place long because inside of him was a little boy looking for his mother. <coughs> Because in his mother, he experienced perfect love. Now listen, that's what motivates you. That's what motivates every human being. You are looking for acceptance, significance, 
dignity, self-esteem. You're looking for your birthright that you already have. And when you live in a world that will ridicule you and bully you and reject you and ignore you and be indifferent toward you, you draw the conclusions, the wrong conclusion about you until you get a revelation of the cross. Now, he said, I love you. She wanted to believe. But it was not love, it was lust. They were both deceived. She aborted their baby. Now he's gone. She's alone, lonely as hell. Counterfeit love never fails to fail. Counterfeit love never fails to fail. Counterfeit love and empty wishing well. I don't love you anymore is how you can tell. Counterfeit love never fails to fail. He says, I love you, but you're afraid to commit because you've been so hurt by the religious counterfeits. For there to be a counterfeit, there has to be a real. Betrayed by a kiss, he knows exactly how you feel. <coughs> Counterfeit love never fails to fail. Counterfeit love, an empty wishing well. I don't love you anymore is how you can tell. Counterfeit love never fails to fail. Look, look away from you and look to that cross. The thorns, the sword, the blood-soaked nails. It's only there you will find true love that never fails. You will discover that you are his child. You will discover that not only did he create you, with a will and the ability to reject him. Because you cannot have a love relationship with a robot. He didn't come to control you. He gave you a will where you can choose to love him or choose to reject him. And we have been a part of the DNA of the first Adam. You can't help it, but let me just tell you how you were born. You were born a crack baby. Corrupt rebellion against Christ's kingdom. And, and you've always been betrayed and disappointed. And the longer you live, the more there's a trail of broken relationships going from one counterfeit to another. Until I can't make myself believe in someone I can't see. I can't make myself pretend to be somebody other than me. I can't make myself believe in a world of make-believe. I'd rather quit and be a hypocrite. Preacher, I prayed a prayer with you. I even let you baptize me, but nothing changed. Everything remained the same, as lost and confused as I could be. So tired, so weak, too tired to even seek. That's what it took for me to just look. Just look. Just look and you will see. The truth, the truth, the truth that will set you free. Just look, just look, just look and you will find the missing piece to the puzzle of life, peace of mind. Just look. Seeing is believing the truth in the midst of the lies. Seeing is believing the Lamb of God was crucified, soaked in His own blood on a cross. He was cursed and died. That's what it took do you see how much he loves you? He passionately loves you. The sin debt's paid. You stand before the court of the universe if you lived a perfect life. You did not do one thing in order to get that. Even the sinner's prayer can be do right to be right. All you got to do is believe. I can't just believe. Well, quit trying to believe and quit listening to all of the counsel of everybody else with Bibles and get it real simple like a child. And you're that child. And here's what you do. You do one thing. You just look. Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be saved, all ye ends of the earth. I'm God and there is none other. 
John 3, Jesus talking to Nicodemus. He's going back to the Old Testament. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that all that gaze upon him will be healed. Do you see what happens when you look away from you and you look away from them and you look away from all the sorrow and rejection that's going on around you circumstantially and in this world that looks like it's out of control and going to hell and all that stuff? You just look, you stop right there. This is in, in the Hebrews 12. It says, you stop and you consider him. He despised the shame, but there was a joy set before him, allowed him to endure the cross. Now, here's what you do. It says, you consider him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Please listen to this. The reason we grow weary and lose heart is because you're not considering him, you're considering yourself. Because I'm not considering him, I'm considering myself. There are times I get distracted and I start getting weary and losing heart. He said, go back to Hebrews 12 too. You're combated about with such a great cloud of witnesses. That's a whole nother glorious revelation that the dead are not dead and never will be. There's much more to life than we can see. Have you seen the unseen? There's a kingdom right here, right now. And the Lord Jesus Christ is risen. And he's right here, right now. And people are walking right past him like I did most of my life. And I'm still so tempted to do. You start considering him. You start considering that cross. You start thinking about how passionately the Lamb of God loves you and who He is. And you don't have to understand Him any more than your child has to understand you to snuggle up with you right now. That baby right there is a picture of you and me if we'll just simply come to our Father and let Him draw us to Himself. He's here to hold us. He's here to nurture us. He's here to fuel us. He's here to give us His joy. Yes, in this world you'll, be a, 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 you'll have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That's what He says. It's all tied up in your personal relationship with a living person who created you for himself and you give that will to him because you choose to do it, not because you're trying to do right to be right. Do you all hear that? Oh, God, thank you. All right, Proverbs 5. My son, of course, you know that's daughter to you. My child, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding. Now, paying attention means you're paying attention. Are right, well, you going to see over the eighth day of the month? That's a listen, Proverbs. You're listening. You're listening. You're paying attention. God Almighty wants to speak to you. Are you listening? All right, not if you're listening to Buddy, Ivan, Juanita, and your thought life to entertain them. And you, have, you just say, all right, God, I'm all yours. I'll, I'll just start with if you're real. I want to listen. What are you saying? He said, you pay attention to my wisdom. You lend your ear to my understanding that you may pre- preserve discretion, and your lips may keep knowledge, and the lips of an immoral woman drip honey. Okay, now watch this. This is great. And her mouth is smooth and oil, but in the end she's bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path, her ways are unstable, and you don't know them. Therefore, hear me now, my children. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Now, let me just tell you what the word from God's mouth is saying to you. It's not complicated. It doesn't, it doesn't take half the night for you to hear it. He's saying one thing to you. The Word of God, the Word is a means of communication. The Word of God is communicating in a way that transcends every human tongue. He is communicating through the incarnation. He spoke the living Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the womb of a virgin into this planet. He is God's Word. And God's Word went to that blood-soaked cross to give His life is a ransom for many that includes you in order to say to you one thing, I am perfect love and I love you. He says, don't depart from that word. Remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house because here's what will happen. Now here, here is what the immoral woman is doing. She's enticing you to go after a counterfeit that's going to betray you and leave you high and dry, and this that ain't all. Watch what, if you start listening to her and you turn away from the words of God Almighty, the truth that says, I love you, and she says, no, you don't. you got to do something to be loved. You know, no, you don't. Oh, this will feel good. God knows you're only human. You, you just have all that stuff. And he said, now, here's what happened. Don't go to the door of her house because this is what will happen. Verse 9, you'll give your honor to others, your years to the cruel one. Aliens will be filled with your wealth and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. And you say, how I have hated instruction and my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation sitting right in the middle of church. He says, drink water from your own cistern and run in water from your own well. Now please in your own time go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. And he says, you get 
get alone with God Almighty and you close the door, that's when you're drinking living water out of your own cistern. You're doing one-on-one business with Jesus. You drink. Should your fountains be dispersed to broad streams of water in the street? Let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed. Now, please listen to this and make a mental note of it. Let implies the natural state. You let your lungs breathe. When you receive him and you are born of his spirit and Christ comes to live in you, you have a new nature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You are born of an incorruptible seed. You have a new nature. You're not the same as you were anymore. A light is turned on inside of you and now you're going to come to the light and you let him love you. You let the same mind be in you that's also in Christ Jesus. You're not trying to make, now it's let. All right, a, a, the life of a, of a vine... The life in the vine goes through the branches. That apple tree out there is not trying to prove it's an apple tree but making apples. You let. When you let him love you, he will love this troubled world through you, even your enemies. All right, now, another thing about drinking water out of your own cistern, you've got the Lord's Prayer right there. And he says, the last thing he says in there is that you're getting along with him. And he said, now, this is so important. This is vital. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness finding opportunity to release God's invincible virtue in the earth. And he says, if you will not forgive others, then you will forfeit the forgiveness you have from your heavenly Father. If you will not forgive someone who has wronged you, has been unjust toward you, that is nothing compared to what your sin did to him. And he says to you, I forgive you, and I'm going to give you the grace to let go and forgive that person who's wronged you. And you say, God, thank you for letting me see this person with your eyes. I don't want this hatred, resentment, unforgiveness in my heart. All right, now that person that you've been hating, that you've been resenting, that you've been blaming for your, min- your misery, it is not that person who's responsible for your misery. You are. It's your reaction to what they did to you that's eating you alive inside. All right, now the Lord Jesus Christ comes and he says, I want to show you that how you've been violated is not just, don't pretend it is, it doesn't, but you forgiving them doesn't mean it was all right. It's not. That's a lost, selfish, sinful person that's trying to feed on you and find fuel in you. All right, and that's all that codependent two ticks without a dog stuff. All right, now you've got to let them go, and he will give you the grace to do it. You pray through that. God, I don't want this in my heart. I hate them. I want, I want to take vengeance on them. And now you're drinking water out of your own cistern. And here's what he does. If you will dare to say, Lord Jesus, let me see that individual with your eyes, you will get set free from them And you'll realize that you are in bondage to them and anybody you hate controls your life. And anybody that controls your life is your Lord. And you can go to a healing service or something right there. There's no word of repentance. but Listen, self-will ain't allowed in the ark. You've got to lose your life for His sake. That's the preaching of the cross that's offensive. All right, now let me tell you something about giving your years to others and to the cruel one. You're going to see it the fourth... Uh, the 16th day of the month in in chapter 4. And it's throughout the Bible. Now please listen before you start blaming the devil like started in the garden. The adversary is necessary. What the Lamb of God did at the cross one day when he let Satan vent all that evil on him He absorbed it and he reversed it for redemptive purpose. He did not cast the devil out of Judas Iscariot. He washed his feet and called him friend. He blessed the one who cursed him. He did not resist evil with evil. He didn't only teach us that on the Sermon of the Mount. He showed us how to live it. He not only showed us by example how to live it, he's come to live inside of you to give you the grace and the courage to live it yourself. And every time a devil swings, he hits himself. Let me just tell you something about you live in a world of adversity. Adversity is coming at you. Adversity is knocking people out. Adversity, the adversary, the adversary, the enemy, the devil's wrath is great because his time is short. These demons are on the loose and all that stuff. But listen, he has not, the Almighty has not lost control. That very evil is serving a higher redemptive purpose. Now, here's what you can do with the adversity that's come into your life. A loved one dies. Someone betrays you. Someone steals from you. Someone lies about you. Somebody mangles you. Somebody, somebody, that adversity comes to you. Now, here is your choice. You can either be destroyed by it, by resisting evil with evil, or you can learn to surf the wave of adversity. And that surfboard is your faith. 
And every time God lets the devil swing at you, the devil hits himself. And every Calvary has a resurrection. And momentary light afflictions are producing for you an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 17, 18. Therefore, you look at the things which are not seen rather than the things which are seen. You've got to get your head out of the counsel of the ungodly. You've got to get along with him. You've got to drink water out, out of your own cistern because here's what you will discover. Now, I want to tell you, Jesus said the, the very last chapter of, of Matthew, all power and authority in heaven and earth is mine. That doesn't leave any for anybody else. All right, then how, we've been taught that there is an adversary who has power. Power. How can his wrath be great because his time is short if he has no power? It's in that verse right there. Anybody that agrees with a lie, that parasite demon, liar, uses that person's energy and life to steal, kill, and destroy. Every human being is in a prayer meeting. And you're the temple of the Holy Spirit intended to be a place of prayer for God Almighty right there in a secret place of your heart. But when you're cursing somebody in your own heart, you're in a demonic prayer meeting. And the powers of darkness, the parasite powers of darkness are using the God-given energy in you in order to destroy another human being. Do you see that? All right, when you are cursing others, when you are judging others, when you are criticizing others, when you are finding fault with others, you are in agreement with the father of lies. And you get to live with whoever you're agreeing with. And that is the rebellion upon which the cruel messenger comes. And he's using me and he's using other human beings to do it, stealing, killing, and destroying. That's your waters. Don't let the aliens be filled with your strength. It's all right there. It's amazing, isn't it? All right, now that immoral woman is, tell, is trying to point you to the counterfeit that will never, never satisfy you. Uh, finally, brethren, I can look at your face and tell you're getting it. It's a new day for you. And I'll tell you, the more we wake up, we're waking up to the truth that sets us free. It's not something you earned. Sunshine shining such a glare, no shade. Sonny been looking for sunglasses all day. You might have overheard a cuss word that he said. He looked everywhere except on top of his head. Are you listening? We've already got what we've been looking for. We're trying to get delivered, and we already are. We've already got what we've been looking for. A little fish swimming in the Atlantic looking for H2O. We're on a one-way street fighting over which way to go. Jesus cried, it is finished. The sin debt is paid. The next thing you know, he was raised from the grave. And we've already got what we've been looking for, trying to get delivered, and we already are. The main thing is let the main thing remain the main thing. The main thing is God's love, not our sin. The main thing is let the main thing remain the main thing. The Savior came to save, not condemn. You know what's left for you and me to do? I want to do something. Well, here's what you can do. You can thank Him. And he says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, this guy was in prison, wrote this, Paul. If you'll give him thanks in your own thought life, drinking water out of your own cistern, Matthew 6, close the door and get along with your father, and you just bask in the wonder of how much he loves you, and he's never here to shame you, I'm going to help you do better. No, he's, all he's got to say is, look, evil's not going to prevail. Darkness doesn't have the last word. Light does. And all of the affliction in the planet Earth, he tells us in Matthew 24, these are birth pains. Something beautiful is being produced through all the adversity. Okay, four minutes, and this is our closing benediction. Come on, George. This is George. What Jesus said would happen is a happening. The headlines read like Matthew chapter 24. What Jesus said would happen is a happening. So what are we complaining and blaming the politicians for? Things are not the way that they seem. There's much more that can be seen. And oh, what a joy you bring. Anything. We ain't anti-anything, we're pro-light and we're pro-love. We ain't anti-anything, we're with a hope from above. You won't get no quarrel out of Georgia, please. We just as 
happy as we can be, and the truth is setting us free, and oh, what a joy you bring, when you're into anything. God is shaking everything that can be shaken, Hebrews 12, until only that which cannot be shaken will remain, verse 27. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, 28. Therefore, we serve our God with reverence and fear and praise His holy name. A consuming fire makes everything clean. anti-left and I ain't anti-right and I ain't anti-Muslim I sure as heaven ain't an anti-Christ and I ain't anti-Hindu and I ain't anti-Jew and I ain't anti-atheist I'm pro-God, pro-me, pro-you I ain't anti-low I ain't anti-high and I ain't anti-somebody mad at me I ain't anti, no, I ain't even anti-sin, I'm pro-savior. And this attitude of gratitude's improving my health and my behavior. Things are not the way that they seem, there's much more than can be seen. And oh, what joy you bring, we ain't anti-anything. As we depart and leave this place, if you are willing to let God love you, okay, we're going on this one, but this is, thus saith the Lord. He's saying it to me, and he's saying it to me, through me to you. Child, you've been striving for so long, fighting to find a way to feel like you belong. But can't you say I love you just like you are? And I've already freely given you the very thing you've been grasping for. So let me love you. Let me love you. Let me lift you high above your fear. Let me love you. Let me love you. Let me give you eyes to see and ears to hear me speak. Let me love you. Living for me is not the same as living with me. I want you to see I long to live my life through you. I'm not primarily interested in your ministry. I'm not even interested in how busy you can be. My primary interest is you. <coughs> Well, if you want to live in self-pity, blame-shifting, fault-finding, buddy, yeah, but, I have an if only, one either what if, tormenting you day and night, <coughs> then remain seated. If you're ready to let God love the hell out of you, go out there and slash on somebody else and let's get up and go do it. <laughs> I love you. Thank you for joining us. This is Bob McLeod. If you'd like more information concerning Our Father's Arms, you can write us at Our Father's Arms, Post Office Box 1158, Jacksonville, Alabama, 36265. Or visit us on the web at www.ourfathersarms.org. 
May the Lord Jesus Christ continue to give us eyes to see the unseen. Amen. Jesus loves you. Do you know?